Glad to be here in Santa Rosa, California at the True North Health Center with Dr. Alan Goldhammer, the world's biggest expert on water only fasting. Dr. Goldhammer, can you tell us just a little bit about what you've done here over the last 30 years and a little bit about your clinic here? Sure, well, we're an integrative medical clinic. We, our staff includes doctors of medicine, chiropractic, osteopathy, naturopathy, and psychology. And we specialize in medically supervised water-only fasting and the use of a whole plant food SOS-free diet to help people with chronic disease get well. That was a perfect explanation right there. What is the number one mistake people make when doing a water fast on their own? You know, all this information out there, people are going and thinking that they can just automatically do a 20 day or a 30 day water fast. I mean, what is, what is your take on that and what, what would you recommend to people? I think the first thing is to think about what's our goal with fasting? What is it we're trying to do? And for most people, they realize that many of the conditions people are currently suffering from are conditions of dietary excess. These are conditions that used to be called the diseases of kings because it was only the wealthy elite people that could eat the way that caused the heart disease, the diabetes, the autoimmune diseases, certain forms of cancer. And so if we realize that the goal is to help us overcome these accumulative excesses that are compromising body function and that we're trying to use perhaps fasting to facilitate that, the first thing to be I would say is to really get a clear picture of what's really going on. And that means a proper medical history, a good physical exam to establish baseline parameters, and basic lab work so that later during fasting you can tell the difference between a really positive but perhaps uncomfortable healing crisis and a problem. Not everything that happens in fasting is necessarily a positive thing. There can be complications or issues, but you can't always easily tell the difference if you don't have data to compare back to. So that's why you want to establish those parameters. Wherever or however you're fasting, that's the first step. Uh, the, the second thing is you need to lead into fasting properly. You don't want to arbitrarily discontinue, for example, medications that you've been on because the negative effect of too rapidly withdrawing a drug, for example, steroid medications or prednisone, can be really devastating. So um, leading in properly, in our uh, case, means eating a whole plant food, SOS-free diet. So SOS is the international symbol of danger, but it also stands for salt, oil, and sugar, which are the chemicals we add to food that stimulate the dopamine production in our brain that leads us to overeating. And in fact, is one of the reasons why people have these conditions of dietary excess to begin with, because they're overeating highly concentrated foods in order to stimulate that dopamine or pleasure response, and they literally can become addicted to this artificial stimulation. So now they're not, they're not just eating this food to try to feel good, they have to keep eating it in order to avoid feeling bad, kind of the hallmark of addiction. So that means before fasting, we're eating a whole plant food SOS-free diet. Um, we're trying to wean down appropriately medications. It's usually a good idea to talk to the person that prescribed the medications in the first place about the appropriate way and the appropriate time to try to withdraw those medications. Now, I know that's a bit of a problem because if you go to, a, for example, a traditional medical doctor with high blood pressure or diabetes or autoimmune diseases, they're going to tell you to do exactly what you're told and they will guarantee you that you'll never get well. They'll promise you, if you do what you're told, you'll be sick forever, you'll be on drugs the rest of your life. So if you walk in and say, well, no, I'd like to get off the drugs, in their experience, it might be they've never seen anybody get well. And so they, they don't understand that there's a pathway to health that doesn't involve continuing to take drugs for the rest of your life. But once you get over, overcome that issue, there is usually a reasonable protocol if one were to withdraw medications in order to do it. So then once a person's off medications and they've done a good lead-in with a health-promoting diet, the next step is to realize that fasting needs to be done in an environment of rest. So you can't be driving an automobile while you're water fasting. You're not going to be safe. Your reflexes are affected. Not a good idea. Also, if you're more active in fasting rather than resting in fasting, you're not going to get the same mobilization of intermediary products and metabolism and toxic products, you're not going to get the benefit of fasting to the degree that you would if you're resting because so much of your energy is diverted to maintaining even basic metabolic function. We don't think, well, driving is pretty passive, but remember the biggest burner of glucose is your brain. So even your brain being too activated can inhibit and uh, delay some of the positive effects that can be generated by true fasting, which is the complete absence of all substances except water in an environment of complete rest. That, in, that complete rest is kind of important. 
One of the reasons why I like recommending fasting being done in a controlled setting is that it's hard for people to have complete rest if they're anxious. And they're naturally anxious when these symptoms of fasting begin to manifest. And there are many. And for example, early phase fasting, people oftentimes may get nausea and even vomiting as bile is dumped from the liver and the body goes through detox. As the kidneys are processing a lot of the products that are elaborated in the blood, sometimes people get low back pain, which is referral pain. They can get skin rashes and discharges. There are all kinds of entertaining symptoms that come up in fasting, most of which are positive attempts to heal itself generated by the body. But again, not everything necessarily is, and so it's good to be able to tell the difference between what is or isn't a positive response and then to make a rational decision about either to continue fasting or to terminate the fast or to modify the fast in order to accommodate the person's ability to adapt to it. Another inherent part of that screening process is making sure people that shouldn't be water fasting don't. Not everybody's a good candidate for water-only fasting. Some people have conditions that would contraindicate fasting, but they might do better with some modified version of it. Maybe they could do intermittent fasting or they could do modified feeding programs, but they wouldn't want to actually do water-only fasting, at least at that point. Then once they get through the fast, the biggest problem people have is appropriate fasting termination. In other words, when you go on the fast, you rapidly mobilize a lot of these materials, which can create many of the symptoms. But it's not all processed just during fasting. That initial phase of refeeding, a lot of things that have been mobilized are now eliminated from the body. And so too rapid a return to feeding could slow down the actual elimination of the products that you spent all this energy mobilizing. And so we have a protocol that we follow at the True North Health Center where we have essentially a day of fresh juices for every week of fasting, a day of raw fruit and vegetables for every week of fasting, and then we slowly reintroduce the more concentrated foods. So in general, it takes about half the length of the fast to be able to get a person through uh, restructured refeeding. So if you have a 20-day fast, you know there's going to be about 10 days of carefully controlled supervised refeeding. And at that point, hopefully people are getting back to more normal activities. Just to point out that there are a lot of people that are doing unsupervised fasting and they're not taking the necessary precautions before they start fasting. So after talking to Dr. Goldhammer, it's very important to do, if you're going to do water only long-term fasting or even short-term fasting, make sure you're prepared and make sure that you come to the True North Health Center or a qualified fasting center so you can be medically supervised, especially if you're on medications like Dr. Goldhammer said. So my, my other question, one that comes up all the time, and I, I, you pretty much answered this, I think, in the last question, is what length can someone safely fast at home? I recommend the water-only fasting, this prolonged water-only fasting, really be done in conjunction with a doctor that's not an idiot and under some type of supervision. But the, the, what can be done at home safely and effectively are these various modifications of fasting where we do intermittent fasting where people narrow the feeding window. So let's say, for example, you don't eat before 10 in the morning and you don't eat after, say, 6 at night. Now you're giving yourself a period of fasting between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. every day. And although it's, it's safer, it doesn't involve a lot of the complications that longer-term fasting can. Uh, it doesn't require, for example, people to necessarily discontinue their existing treatment regimes. It does give the body a chance to induce some of these metabolic changes that are associated with fasting. Now granted, short-term fasting has smaller effects than perhaps the larger fasting, but for many people that's all they need. For example, if the goal is to clear the palate, if the goal is to induce some of these uh, detoxifying enzyme systems and pathways, you may be able to do that without having to resort to something that might require you know, taking time off work and resting and all the rest. It's not the um, fasting they object to, it's having to rest or to take time off work or not to have to drive the kids to school and deal with all those realities. The problem is people that aren't in a position to get rest are not in a position to do long-term water fasting. Regardless of whether it's supervised or not, you still have to be able to have a period of time where you can take that kind of a break. And if you can't, better to do some modified version, which would be safe and maybe slower, but you know, health results from healthful living. If people are willing to do diet, sleep, and exercise, and they do it right and they do it long enough, most of these things are going to unwind over time, whether they speed it up with fasting or not. I know everybody's biochemistry is different, <clears throat> and people say, well, I mean, you're going to get the most benefits doing supervised water-only fasting, probably in most cases, but then people say, well, if I just do intermittent fasting, 
let's say I do uh, go till noon and I eat lunch and then I go till 6 p.m. every day and my eating window is from 12 to 6. Is there a way that you can say the benefits, like for example, if I do the intermittent fasting, it's going to take me three months of doing that for the same benefits I'm going to get in one week if I go to... Junior it doesn't work. quite work that way because for some people, it depends first on the person and their condition and their circumstance. Um, so some conditions will respond without ever doing a single day of fasting perfectly fine. Other conditions may not respond without doing long-term water-only fasting. So here's what, how it works. There's doctors all around the country and they advise people to eat whole food, plant-based diets, get exercise and sleep, and they have huge success. People are getting well, they're overcoming their conditions. But those same doctors will tell you they have a certain percentage of their populations, despite the fact they're getting compliance with their patients, that have difficulties that aren't easily resolved. And oftentimes those are the kind of patients that we're seeing at the True North Health Center. The people, they've done their best, but despite their best, it's not good enough. Or they have patients that want to do it, but they can't. They're addicts. Whether they're addicted to alcohol, tobacco, or caffeine, or they're addicted to the artificial chemicals put into food like salt, oil, and sugar, they're doing their best, but they just can't seem to break the cycle. They need a little bit of extra help. And that's where a place like the True North Health Center can be helpful because it's an environment that really supports those kinds of changes. But for the majority of people, if they just eat the diet, get appropriate activity, and get the sleep they need, the body heals itself. And so, yes, it's true that sometimes a few weeks of fasting could approximate several months of feeding. But there's other situations. We have all, this happens all the time. People call up, we, we tend to book ahead, so there's sometimes a lag between when they want to come in and we can get them in. But, so we give them advice on the phone about what they can begin to start to do in preparing for the fast. And by the time it's time to come into fast, they're already better. You know, it's so annoying. <laughs> so and it happens a lot where people are able to just making the dietary changes. They're able to overcome the symptoms that sometimes they've been managing for months or years medically. And we haven't even gotten to see them yet. So clearly diet, sleep, and exercise are the majority of the effect size. Fasting is a tool to make things happen faster or in people that are so sick or have such stubborn problems that it's not enough, we'll be able to move them along a little more quickly. So what you're saying is basically what a lot of people are starting to realize now, that it all comes down to uh, an accumulation. Everybody has a self-healing mechanism, and the self-healing mechanism is being suppressed because of all the stress, the toxins in the food, the toxins in the air, the toxins in the water. I mean, we're just having a chemical soup that's just reducing, reducing, reducing us and all the negative emotional patterns and everything else, and it's just bringing the body down. And quite frankly, well-intentioned but misguided medical treatment. Yes. So one of the things that we see is that people have symptoms, they go to a doctor, and the doctor gives them advice about how to suppress those symptoms, but the long-term consequence of their treatment is what leads to some of the chronic degenerative changes that now we have to try to unwind. And we spend a lot of our effort undoing well-intentioned but misguided treatment that's not actually dealing with the underlying cause of the problem. Right now, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer are the leading reasons why people are, uh, are dying and, and suffering and getting treatment. But they're not the actual reasons why people are suffering and dying, mm -hmm. which is smoking and drinking and eating an animal-based, highly processed food diet. And so since medicine is mostly trying to deal with the diseases and not the causes, what ends up happening is they're developing all kinds of often very powerful treatments that may be more or less successful at dealing with the symptoms of the disease without actually helping, encouraging, intimidating, or supporting people at making the changes necessary to actually get well. And that's why they tell people, if you do what you're told, you'll be sick forever and be on drugs the rest of your life. Have you noticed that people are starting to trend more and more and more over the last 10 years towards natural medicine and, and towards taking responsibility for their own health? And the doctors as well, I mean, have you noticed or talked to anybody where the doctors are saying, they must be realizing that their medications are not working. I mean, it kind of seems to me that we are making progress in a certain, you know, as time goes on with the internet and people doing more research, but at the same time, there's a lot of misleading information out there as well. Well, there's always been misleading information. I mean, it goes back to the beginning of, of when people started giving advice. Uh, that's where uh, we, there's two things I would say. We need a philosophy of healthcare uh, to rely on, and we also need more and better research looking at the actual causes of disease. 
And, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to do here at the True North Health Center and through our True North Health Foundation is really trying to do primary research looking at what it is you have to do to actually get sick people well and what you have to do to help people that are now healthy stay that way. And what it looks like it comes back to is some very basic principles. Diet, sleep, and exercise. You know, and there's a lot of debate about diet, about what is a healthy diet, what's a health-promoting diet. You know, in our experience, a whole food diet that focuses on plant-based foods and eliminates the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products, eliminates the salt, oil, and sugar, eliminates the highly processed, fractionated foods uh, that people are eating, makes a huge difference. And if you look at our data, uh, you'll see when it comes to treating these primary conditions, for example, high blood pressure, we have the largest effect sizes shown in treating high blood pressure in humans doing this very simple intervention. Get people on a whole food plant-based diet, use water fasting until you normalize blood pressure, eliminate the medications, and then get people to sustain a health-promoting diet and lifestyle, and they sustain the results. We have an average effect size of 60 points in stage 3 hypertension. Essentially, all essential hypertension patients that are willing to do these interventions can expect to normalize their blood pressure, eliminate the need for medication. And, you know, the results are not that dissimilar with conditions like type 2 diabetes and many of the autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis and ankylosing spondylitis and asthma, eczema, psoriasis. These conditions respond very predictably to very simple conservative interventions. The downside is you have to keep living healthy in order to sustain the results because you're not curing anything, you're managing it. You know, and that's the thing people get a little frustrated with. They want to cure, i.e. something they can take that will now let them go do whatever they want to do. And what this is about is learning to live in such a way that the body can maintain a healthful state. And that's a little bit more effort. That actually covers one of my other questions, which was can someone fast and carry on their daily activities and work? And that, and it, that just goes to show you how important it is to rest when you're fasting. I think it's one of the most important uh, considerations that people be in a restful and supportive state when they're doing prolonged fasting. Working often doesn't uh, support that. But you can do a healthy diet when you're working and you're exercising and you're driving. And so there's no reason why we can't focus on uh, fine-tuning the diet so that the body's able to do exactly what it does uh, in, in a fasting state, all but somewhat slower and in a more controlled manner. I tell you what, when I did my 18-day water fast and I did work for the first week and I did do light exercise for the first week and I documented it too, how I felt, and one of the things that affected me the most was stress because my mind, you know, in the, in the midst of all the stuff that was going in in the office and it seemed like everything happened that week that could have happened. And do you notice that people have or go through changes when they're medically supervised water only fasting where they have bouts of anxiety and stress? Well, it's interesting that every major religion, the Jews, the Jains, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, everybody's got a tradition about fasting. And there's a reason. Because fasting can change how you feel about yourself, the world around you. It, has, it can have profound effects on you in addition to the physical effects that we tend to focus on at the True North Health Center. Remember, your biggest burner of glucose is your brain. And so you have profound impact on your energetics when you're concentrating or relaxing versus under stress or not under stress. So it's not surprising that uh, psychological activity can have an impact on your ability to fast effectively. And remember, when you're fasting, our goal is not to make you feel good. It's to actually get you healthy. So we don't care if you're uncomfortable when you're fasting. For example, people that are more active often feel more comfortable, not less comfortable when they're fasting. But it's because they're slowing down the rate of detoxification. So what we'd rather do is have you rest. You may not feel good, but if you get good, you'll forgive us for whatever uncomfortable processes you go through. So the, we have to be a little bit careful how we dis define success. It's mm -hmm. the same thing people are running into when they start talking about the, uh, like the paleo diets or the ketogenic diets. Um, the things that might be useful short-term aren't necessarily sustainable or good long-term. The things, for example, that competitive athletes do to maximize short-term performance aren't necessarily health-promoting. Things that make you a more competitive athlete today aren't necessarily the thing that will let you live a longer and healthier life long-term. So in our practice, it's not necessarily about maximizing short-term athletic performance, it's about maximizing long-term health. And the big thing there is not just living longer, i.e. increasing life expectancy, but more importantly, living better, 
i.e. increasing healthy life expectancy. We lag in the United States in both areas. We're not living longer than, for example, places like the European Union where they're spending less, you know, a third the, the cost per patient on healthcare, but, you know, actually having better results in some measures than the United States. What we're wanting to do is reduce the, the nine plus years of debility that the average person is experiencing and the 17 years of ill health that they're experiencing and where the vast majority of healthcare dollars are spent, by the way. Uh, so the idea isn't that you're going to live forever, but you want to live until you die. You want to live fully functional until you reach your genetic potential. You don't want to spend the last 10 years of your life unable to talk or move, lying in some nursing home bed waiting for somebody to come and change your diaper. You want to be able to live fully functional. The best chance of doing that is avoiding the chronic degenerative diseases that are caused by dietary excess. And that's why we want to get rid of the animal products, the highly processed chemicals added to food, get people exercising and figure out ways to deal with their stress more effectively. A lot of the trend out there right now, a lot of people are doing water-only fasting from their home for weight loss. And they, the, that's, that's a big trend right there. And then also the 5-2 diet. Can you explain if that's even something that is safe to do where they're fasting 24 hours twice a week? Well, the good news is that if people adopt a whole plant food SOS-free diet, they will lose weight in a predictable way. If they happen to be a male, they can expect between two and three pounds a week of weight loss, and if they're a female, between one and two pounds a week of weight loss consistently, predictably. Um, if they're willing to do some exercise, you know, they can even facilitate those numbers further. So they don't need to be doing prolonged water-only fasting as a weight loss technique, and I don't recommend prolonged water-only fasting as a weight loss technique because there's better ways to achieve um, weight loss if that's the only concern. We recommend fasting because of the physiological changes associated with improving health, not necessarily because it's a faster way to lose weight. And it's a little bit deceptive because it is true, water-only fasting patients lose an average of a pound a day. But remember, it's not just fat you're burning. There's also glycogen in the muscles that's being utilized. There's fiber in the gut that's being eliminated. And there's uh, some physiological dehydration that occurs in fasting. So not all of the scale weight is just fat. By the end of the second week of long-term water-only fasting, most of the calories are, in fact, being derived from fat if the person's in a resting state. But again, if they're more active, now they're going to have to burn more glucose, which means more gluconeogenesis, more protein utilization, not exactly what we're trying to do long term. What people can do to facilitate weight loss, as we've talked about, is narrow the feeding window. They can also choose, for example, maybe one or two days a week where they can able to not have to be as energetic. Maybe they go on raw fruit and vegetables only. They might get a couple of pounds of salad, a pound or two of fruit, limit their caloric intake to six or 800 calories, uh, get a, maintain appropriate uh, restricted activity, and that may help move them along the path a little bit quicker. One of the reasons where Fasting is helpful as taste and adaptation changes. If you take a person that doesn't like salad and fruit and you know just can't choke down the taste of swill, put them on a water fast, afterwards all of a sudden that taste of swill becomes quite desirable because there's actually a change in the perception of taste. In fact, we're doing a study here right now at the True North Health Center where we've been able to quantify minimum detection thresholds to salt and sugar, and these other substances, and show the changes quantitatively in a blinded fashion before and after long-term fasting. Well, the same changes happen all but a little bit slower with feeding. For example, if you put people on a low-salt diet, it takes about a month, but after about a month on a low-sodium diet, people begin to neuroadapt, and they can actually taste the natural sodium in the food at a higher degree, even to the point where some of the soups or things from a restaurant that you normally might have liked now become too salty. There's actually mm -hmm. an over-response. And so neuroadaptation to salt to sugar, to fat, does occur, and it occurs feeding. It might occur a little bit more quickly if you're using intermittent fasting or some of these modifications. It absolutely happens more quickly when we do prolonged water-only fasting. So if a person's patient, they're going to achieve their weight loss. If you're losing two pounds a week, it's 100 pounds a year, okay? So you got to start asking yourself, what, how fast do you have to do this in, you know, in terms of if you want to try to do it faster but it compromises your health, is that a really good solution? For example, we could remove your thigh at the hip and you would immediately be 40 pounds lighter. Not probably a good long-term health strategy, so we wouldn't recommend that type of rapid weight loss technique. You can go on a greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh diet and make your body sick enough that, yeah, you, you'll blunt your appetite and, not, you know, and lose some weight. Doesn't necessarily mean that's a good long-term health strategy. Because ketosis induces um, inhibition of the hunger drive, that can be used to facilitate weight loss, but we don't want to induce that in a way that compromises long-term health.
For somebody that might think, I can go to the True North Health Center or I can do um, water fasting for regenerative or anti-aging properties, or let's say I'm 60 years old and I want to regenerate my body and, and, and produce those stem cells and go into that state of autophagy, would you get that normally just slowly over time with a regular organic SOS diet? Well, there's a couple of things. There's, there's no question. There's research, including some of the work that we're doing, that does show that many of these markers or biomarkers of aging uh, tend to improve with fasting, sometimes profoundly. Um, but I think you might consider looking at it a slightly different way. For example, rats that are given restricted feeding, you can double their lifespan by putting them on 60% of what their normal ad libitum eating might be. But I don't know that we're actually uh, extending their life as much as what we are is we're stopping, shortening it. For example, if you have uh, rats living uh, uh, in nature, they live to a certain time, but it's limited by predation. If you eliminate predation but continue to feed them the amount of food they would normally eat in a natural setting, they double their lifespan. And so it's not that, uh, for example, if calorie restriction is, is um, extending their life, it's overfeeding and shortening it. So it's interesting, if you look at these biomarkers that are, that are associated with exercise, for example, many of them improve dramatically, these markers of aging. Those same biomarkers tend to increase with fasting. At the same level? Yeah, well, actually, fasting in some cases is even more potent. But the point is, why would vigorous exercise induce certain anti-aging changes that are the same anti-aging changes associated with fasting? I would suggest that it's because both fasting and exercise help us undo the consequence of dietary excess. All of these issues are basically not, that we're not so much looking to extend life. What we're trying to do is we want to stop shortening our potential. And we're shortening it with dietary excess. And if you have dietary excess, but you counteract it with some exercise or some fasting, you get some benefit. But the best benefit would be to stop putting the excess in to begin with. And then the need for fasting would be more mitigated. Although I'd have to say, I think the people that may get the most benefit of all from fasting are healthy people that are using fasting proactively and preventatively. And the reason for that may turn out to be that these detoxifying en enzyme pathways, for example, how do you get toxins out of your body? It's all enzymatically driven. How do you mobilize fat? It's lipo lipogenesis, lipolysis is enzymatically driven. Glycogen, glyconogelysis requires enzymatically driven. Fat. These enzyme pathways are facilitated during fasting and it, they're cumulative. And so what we may find is that every single time people fast, whether it's 12 hours at night or two to four weeks in a controlled setting, you're inducing detoxifying pathways. You're not just detoxifying when you're fasting, you're detoxifying every single day after that as well. And the better you facilitate those enzyme systems, the more likely you are to keep up with the load that modern life brings. The same thing happens with exercise. You induce, you get better at mobilizing glycogen stores, you get better at mobilizing these macronutrients as you exercise more. That's part of what being a conditioned athlete is, inducing enzymatic pathways. I suggest that that may also be happening with fasting. You're inducing detoxifying enzyme pathways. You might be doing it every night, you might be doing it once a year, whatever the pattern is. Now, how much is optimum, et cetera, that's exactly the research that we're doing right now. We're working with the Buck Institute, with Luigi Fontana from Washington University. We're looking at biomarker changes in fasting. They can measure, for example, autophagy efficiency before and after fasting. We can measure the number of mutations in B lymphocytes before and after fasting, which correlates well with aging and cancer vulnerability, et cetera. We're looking at all kinds of biomarkers that frankly weren't even available to a, a look at years ago. And now we're doing it before and after long-term fasting at, uh, at the Chino Health Center. Breaking a fast, very controversial, a lot of misinformation out there online, a lot of videos out there, a lot of people getting sick, a lot of people recommending bone broth, a lot of people rec saying you can eat chocolate. Uh, what, I mean, I, what I wanted to, to clarify with everybody out there and let Dr. Goldhammer answer this question. So if you're watching this video, hopefully you'll be doing a medically supervised over here. But not only that, but just to clarify all the misinformation out there. What is, what well, is, let's what's be the clear, we're, we're fasting, at least from our viewpoint, to mobilize and eliminate materials that have accumulated that shouldn't be there and to induce pathways of detoxification. So the idea of going on very concentrated food as you come off the fast is usually advocated by people that really don't have actual experience fasting because people that have done a lot of fasting wouldn't do that because you, it's very clear what happens when you, you know, when you induce those hyper-concentrated uh, nutrient intakes 
immediately after fasting. So the way we're doing it is we want to kind of ease the system back into function. Typically, for every week of water fasting, um, we would have usually a day of fresh fruit or vegetable juices, depending on the patient, exactly what you're using. And we would then do a day of raw fruit and vegetables, which tend to be high nutrition, but low caloric density. And then we might introduce more concentrated foods, steamed vegetables, eventually starchy vegetables, nuts and seeds, whatever it is that's going to be appropriate for that patient. But it takes about half the length of the fast to get back to normal caloric intake. So if you have a 20-day fast, you know you've got about 10 days of carefully structured refeeding. That's where a lot of people mess up. Is they because the brain is saying, well, yeah, it's time to eat. Let's let's catch up, make up our, for our lost reserves. But the problem is, overfeeding at that point not only can pose very serious, even life-threatening risks like refeeding syndrome and post-fasting edema and food shock, but it also would uh, prevent the body from being as efficient at actually eliminating a lot of the metabolic products that have been mobilized during fasting and allow greater opportunity for resorption. For example. Most of your metabolic products are not eliminated in the stools. They're eliminated in the urine. Because the urine is the byproduct of the blood being filtered by the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So most of your toxins aren't even coming out in the stools. The, think about feeding. You shove stuff in one end, it goes through the digestive system, eventually you try to push it out the other end. The only thing that actually gets into your body is the stuff that gets absorbed through the fine mucosal membrane. And that won't let hardly anything in unless it's damaged. The fine mucosal membrane, you can't even get proteins through that, just amino acids unless it's damaged, and then the spaces get wider. And the thing that damages it, amongst other things, may be free radicals. So when you think about people that smoke, they get that um, uh, premature wrinkling of their collagen tissue in their face, the, the, the smoker's face appearance. That's nothing more than free radicals causing cross-linkaging of collagen tissue. That's what a wrinkle is. Well, smoking doesn't just affect the face and prematurely age the face. It prematurely ages all the tissues in the body, including the animal lining of the blood vessels, which is why 80% of smokers never get lung cancer. It's because they die of heart disease before they live long enough to get the tumors. Because of the damaging effect of free radicals. Well, free radicals, whether it's from smoking or drinking alcohol, including red wine, bathes the body with free radicals. That's why people that drink a lot get cirrhosis of the liver, which is basically fatty scar tissue that's forming as a consequence of irritation. If you don't want to smoke or drink, but you want a lot of free radicals, another thing you can do is eat heated fats, like fried foods. Okay, or foods that have oil cooked at high temperatures, your breads, your crackers, most of the foods that are in the grocery store, which is nothing more than a few federally subsidized grains like wheat, corn, and soy, cooked with oil, salt, and sugar, and smashed together in different forms. That's essentially what people are eating. And of course, it's all a rich source of free radicals, so it's not surprising people have tons of gut leakage and all these problems that go along with that. And the BT toxin and the GMO yeah. foods well, and, and, and the and pesticides and all the other... I mean, about animal food, right. talking about bone broth or any kind of animal food. Animals biologically concentrate the poisons in the environment. If you just look at, let's say, a calorie of animal food versus a calorie of plant food, even commercially raised plant foods and stuff, the biological concentration of poisons can be two times up to a thousand times the concentration in animal foods, depending on the product you're talking about, compared to plant foods. Overall, plant foods are much less biologically concentrated compared to animal foods. If nothing else, that's a good reason to be very cautious about how much meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products we're eating. For the SOS diet, uh, as a, if someone uses non-organic versus organic? Well, we would argue that using organic foods has advantages, not just because you have a lower toxicity level, but also there's the moral, ethical, spiritual, environmental. There's a lot of reasons why we're advocating a whole food, plant-based, SOS-free diet. Um, and one of those is that it reduces your total body load of uh, toxic materials. If you were to do a fat biopsy, for example, on a person, you'd find hundreds of different chemicals at various concentrations. And if you track back how those chemicals got there, if you excluded directly taking drugs or smoking and those kind of things, the, the single biggest behavior is going to be the consumption of animal food. By eliminating animal food, we eliminate one of our most biologically concentrated sources of toxins. And so people will say, well, what if I get grass-fed, organically grown, cows that are loved before they're killed, whatever. Mm -hmm. And yes, that makes it less bad. But something being less bad doesn't make it good. It just makes it less bad. I would advocate we'd all be better off, the planet would be better off, our bodies would be better off if we adopted a whole plant food diet that didn't have any sugar oil or salt added to it and ate an abundance of those foods, eliminating the other foods. If, if people just did that, get their sleep and exercise, the body begins to heal itself. It begins to undo these consequences of dietary exercise. It's really quite remarkable. And we get to see it every day. 
You know, it's done, it's even faster when you fast, but many of our patients never skip a meal. You know, they're coming in, maybe they're on medications that you can't get them off of them right away so they're not candidates for water fasting, or maybe they have conditions that don't allow them to adapt. They've got their kidney disease is too severe to adapt to the water fasting. They have contraindications to fasting. They still can get well. Just adopting a health promoting diet and lifestyle, and it, you, can, you can predict in the vast majority of cases not only who's going to get well, but over what period of time they're likely to need that. How hard is it for people once they leave here to, I mean, if, if they go out to a restaurant or something, they're obviously not going to be able to have an yeah. SOS diet, so does that mean they pretty much have to... I disagree. One of the things that we do here is we train people to function in this world uh, more effectively because you can adapt uh, your dietary preferences even in the world. But I would say that adopting a health-promoting diet in a world that's designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable mm -hmm. and give you what you want rather than what you need is very difficult. Yeah. It takes a tremendous amount of effort, particularly if people are fatigued, miserable, and in pain. They don't have the energy or the focus or the education to necessarily successfully venture forth. But once you get them healthy and get them brainwashed or educated, then what happens is they're able to adapt to that environment much more successfully. You know, I do a lot of traveling and I am able to find whole plant foods on the road. There are these places, for example, when you travel, they're called grocery stores and they actually have fruits and vegetables that you can get and prepare you know, banana, peel and eat. It's not like rocket science. It's not too difficult. Even in restaurants, for example, many times you can go into different types of restaurants. For example, a Thai restaurant. If you look at their side dishes, they oftentimes have steamed vegetables and brown rice and healthy. And you can order literally side dishes or you can order a standard dish with sauce on the side and ask them not to put the salt and the oil and the sugar and all the other stuff. And oftentimes you can be successful. Sometimes you'll get a little resistance because they won't believe you would actually eat food without all the grease and the slime. But, you know, once you get them trained, you can actually find in most places something that's edible and allows you to get through the, through the process. Even a steakhouse oftentimes, well, you can get baked potatoes, you can get steamed vegetable of the day, you can get, you know, oftentimes there's salad bars. There's places now, you know, chain health food stores that have salad bars. You can select a few items that are not full of grease, oil, and salt. You know, so it, didn't. it takes effort, it takes discipline, it takes education, but it's absolutely doable. I'll tell you what, I, ne I never realized how much pe of people's lives revolve around food until I took food completely out. And even though I've been doing intermittent fasting for about a year now, off and on, even when I was doing the water fasting, it was, it was just this whole new perception of how much, just watching people, just how much people's lives and how many hours out of the day people focus on their next meal or eating. And, and I'm talking about just watching people's standard American diet where breakfast and then, and then they go to lunch for two hours and then dinner for two hours. I mean, if you add up all the time in someone's life that's around food, it's just incredible. It's amazing when you think about the shopping, the chopping, the prepping, the eating, and then the eliminating of the foods after you've eaten the foods and dealing with the consequences of the stuff. It's a huge part, and it always has been for humans. For most animals, they spend an even higher percentage of their time hunting, eating, gathering. You know, that's essentially what their life is. And so we as humans now have delegated that responsibility to other people. So what they don't realize is they're hiring people to cook their food for them, whether it's the food manufacturer that smashes their wheat, soy, uh, and corn with their oil, salt, and sugar into a package, or whether you're going to a restaurant and the chef is preparing and the people are delivering it, or the frozen dinner that is so difficult to heat up and eat that they have to call the place to have it delivered because it's too much trouble to actually heat up their own uh, process. So we've become energy conserving fat storage devices basically, not wanting to put any effort into acquiring, preparing uh, food. In fact, we don't even want to chew because it's like too exhausting because we're so, you know, fatigued. Yeah. And so we have to have all this highly processed food. Now, that can really change. It, when you get used to eating whole foods, you can find you can make this very simple. For example, let's say we're going to have fresh fruit in the morning and oatmeal or something or some flax seeds. You know, that can be paired in just a few minutes. It doesn't take long to do that. If we make, when we make dinner at night, we make an extra salad extra steamed vegetables, a couple of potatoes, maybe we have them cold the next day, whatever. This can be done quite effectively and efficiently. We, there's, we actually have two cookbooks that are vegan, SOS free. The Health Promoting Cookbook and the Bravo Cookbook. These books have recipes that are simple enough, even I can make the stuff. And believe me, 
I'm not a trained chef, but it turns out good, it's tasty, it's simple, it can be done. So again, I think a lot of this is about educating people about a different way of looking at it, a different way of doing it. It doesn't have to be all-encompassing, but it definitely takes some effort in order to make it happen. It's not going to happen spontaneously. And so that's really the, the problem is you have people that are um, so exhausted from their lousy diets and poor lifestyles that the idea of putting any effort into anything is overwhelming. What are your thoughts on the raw, <clears throat> raw goat's milk and raw sheep's milk in comparison to raw cow's milk? Well, because something can be less bad, for, and for example, goat and uh, sheep milk may have significant advantages over cow's milk, it doesn't rise to the level of where it would be health promoting. We wouldn't advocate animal milk of any kind except perhaps the animal that it's designed to feed. What we would recommend is that people eat exclusively whole plant foods and without the addition of salt, oil, and sugar and that the, all of the calories come from the foods as we were mentioning. Like for example, people ask me sometimes, how do they know if they have a big enough salad, if they don't have a scale there to weigh out a pound or something? And I tell them, just make the salad and just put it on your desk and wait for your colleagues to come in, and they'll go, oh my gosh, you're not gonna try to eat all that, are you? And if they don't react with shock and awe, it means you got the wrong size bowl. You gotta get a bigger bowl. <laughs> and uh, you know, the same thing, you gotta eat a lot of this food, because this is low density food. Salad only has 100 calories a pound. Fruit only has 300 calories a pound. You have to eat a lot of pounds of food just to get enough to be able to survive. Now, starchy vegetables, potatoes, rice, and beans have about 500 calories a pound, so you, can, you know, it's a little bit more practical. You can get enough of it in to sustain yourself. And some of the very rich uh, uh, foods like nuts, avocado, coconut, we do actually recommend our patients limit those quantities. We don't recommend that they eat those with complete abandon because they are very rich. And overall, the diet we're recommending ends up about 10 to 12 percent of calories from protein, about 15 to 18 percent of calories from fat with the balance coming from complex carbohydrates. So it's not even technically a low-fat diet in the sense that 15 to 18 percent of calories is half what maybe the average person is eating from fat, but it's actually a little richer than some of the very restricted cardiovascular disease diets that people are using specifically to try to reverse um, atherogenesis. And what we found actually is even though the diets are a little more flexible, they work very well in terms of reverse, helping people reverse cardiovascular disease and the signs and symptoms associated with it. What about the uh, coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil? Yeah. So we recommend all oils be eliminated from the diet, including olive oil and coconut oil and safflower oil. Um, these are all nine calories per gram, highly concentrated uh, food byproducts or processed food factors. We do want you to get fat in your diet, but it comes from things like watermelon and lettuce and grains and nuts and seeds and avocado. So there's plenty of fat in food to meet our 10 to 12 percent of, uh, uh, or excuse me, 15 to 18 percent of calories from fat needs. You don't need to highly process foods and pour it all over your food any more than you need to rip the sugar out of foods and make refined carbohydrates and put it on your food. You get plenty of sugar in your whole foods to meet your carbohydrate needs. You get plenty of protein in your foods to meet your protein needs, and you get perfectly adequate amounts of fat if a variety of whole foods are used without the addition of any highly processed SOS, sugar, oil, or salt. Seeds versus nuts. Well, they're both incredibly concentrated nutritional sources. Um, the one advantage I've seen to using seeds as a source of concentrated fat over nuts is that for some people, nuts can be a bit of a food trigger. So it's hard for them to have a little without eating a lot, where seeds don't seem to have that same situation. Part of it may be perhaps a slightly smaller ratio of fat per volume. Not sure exactly what the explanation of the food trigger issues are. But for somebody, for example, if they can't control themselves well, if they're eating macadamia nuts or almonds or something, then we might use a different source of fat for them that they find they don't have those difficulties with. Um, for most people, if they want to control what they put in their mouth, they have to not bring it in the house. You know, if they're, they're kidding themselves, if they think they're bringing it into their nest and that they're not going to eat it. Um, so keeping a really clean environment in the house tends to make it helpful so that if an exception is made, it can actually be an exception rather than becoming a rule. Himalayan crystal salt, Celtic sea salt. Well, the advantage to these very expensive salts is they have contaminants. They have other minerals in them, so there's slightly lower amount of sodium per volume. So there's nothing healthy about them at all, but they're slightly less toxic than just the pure re refined carbohydrates. So I would totally argue against using any of these added salts in the diets of most uh, patients. There may be a few exceptions, people that have specific metabolic pathway problems where they don't absorb sodium, you might have to increase their concentration. But that's a, 
a very rare exception. Uh, and the fact that you make the salt really expensive and you put some contaminants, so per volume it's slightly less sodium, doesn't make it healthy. And the same thing for all the hidden salts like the, the tamari and the liquid salts and the, and the, the uh, aminos and the different, they're all basically liquid salt. It's just people are trying to play let's pretend. It's like saying, oh, if I use brown sugar, somehow that's going to make the, the, the dish healthy. It's not. Yeah. Spring water versus distilled water, alkaline water, hydrogen water. So what we are designed to uh, need is water, H2O. So the disadvantage to spring water is much of the groundwater has been contaminated. So normally you would drink uh, spring water or rainwater. Rainwater is essentially distilled mm -hmm. water. Except that even rainwater now picks up some contaminants from the, the atmosphere. So the best thing to do with water is to somehow, and you have choices, remove the contaminants from the actual water. Just leave the water behind. The best way to do that, the most efficient way, is distillation. So, and with fasting patients, they're very sensitive. They don't tolerate municipal waters and the hydrogenated halocarbons and all the contaminants and stuff. So what we do is we take water, we pre-filter it, we steam distill it, and then we post-filter it to catch anything that might come off of distillation. So we have very pure water. But for most people, just uh, fractionally steam distilled water is going to give them pure water. If they don't want to do distilled water, they can use a, an effective reverse osmosis system. There's other filtration systems that will get most of the contaminants out of the water, and that's probably going to be adequate for, for normal use. What we wouldn't recommend is municipal water or, quote, spring water, which is you know, you never know what's going to be in there. It's no healthier than whatever, you know, where they're sucking it out of. So some type of filtration purification for water, we recommend steam distillation is the most effective. As far as, um, you know, you don't need to spend $6,000 for a water purification system to alkalize it. If you thought for some reason you wanted to alkalize, I'm not advocating that. But if you no. wanted to do that, you could put some baking soda or something in the water and alkalize it, I guess. But there'd be no reason to do that. You're perfectly well designed to drink water eat food, and your body pH and balance tends to work itself out perfectly good. What should people do after they're done fasting? Should they continue with uh, alternate day? Or should they do one day a week? In many cases, um, you have two types of patients. Some patients we fast to their optimum weight, so they no longer have weight loss issues to deal with. Other people are not able to fast long enough to completely normalize their situation. So let's say, for example, you're 100 pounds overweight and you fast, you lose 50 pounds, but you still have 50 pounds to lose. So we're going to expect that weight if you're a male to come off at about two up to three pounds a week, if you're a female, one to two pounds a week. On the SOS diet? On, on an SOS diet. If we want to make it happen a little quicker, we could add the could ex, uh, tighten the intermittent fasting mm -hmm. regime. We could add one or two calories, redu reduce calorie a day. We could encourage more vigorous exercise and activity. So there's lots of things you can do to try to kind of move things along. But again, those averages are pretty predictable. If people are eating healthy, living healthily, they're going to lose that weight. So if, a, if it's a male, we can expect that it's 20 weeks, 25 weeks out, they're going to be at optimum weight. At that point, we don't necessarily want to continue to lose weight to be underweight. And so maybe now we don't do the calorie restriction uh, as much, or we maybe we widen the feeding window, or we, you know, so that everything gets into balance. Maybe we haven't been using nuts or seeds or concentrated foods to facilitate additional, we might add a little bit of that back in so people get into that balance. So this has to be, fine tuning is just done individually. And most people can figure that out really simply just by paying attention. You know, that, just, that made me think of a guy out there that's, that's promoting uh, kind of like the hunter-gatherer method or whatever, and he's saying it fast for, t for close to 24 hours and he just has one meal a day and that you can just gorge on whatever you want for that one meal a day. Meat. I, I want to just point out that it's the hunter-gatherers, you know, average age of death was probably in the mid-30s. So <laughs> I don't know that we want to necessarily um, use a population who, whose average age of death was dramatically lower than what we're shooting for. If you're only concerned to live to, say, 35 you want to maximize athletic performance, you don't care about the long-term health consequences, I'm not sure what the, that's not my area of experience. But if your goal is to live fully and functionally till you reach your genetic potential, hopefully in the eighth, ninth decade or longer, that wouldn't be a recommended program from my viewpoint. And it doesn't make any physiological sense I know, either. I know, so. so I think that, you know, there's lots of people that will do recommend lots of things. And what my colleague Dr. McDougall says, people love good news about their bad habits. 
And so anybody that's willing to tell you what you want to hear that allows you to keep eating the greasy, fatty, slimy, processed foods, uh, they're yeah. going to sell a lot of books. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're going to be very, very healthy, you know, or successful, oh, I should gosh. say, if not healthy. Can you explain what happens with the adrenals and the cortisone, cortisol, uh, stress and anxiety? I mean, I know we kind of touched on stress and anxiety. Have you noticed any changes uh, or have you heard of it with intermittent fasting or water only fasting, how that affects the adrenal glands because so many people are under so much stress these days. They have adrenal burnout. They're all on some sort of stimulants. It's amazing how many adults with children are actually that I'm running into that are hooked on Adderall and stimulants and everything. It's just out of control. Well, let's think about the most common highly addictive nervous system stimulant that people are addicted to, and they even give it to kids. It's caffeine. They give them chocolate, they give them cola, they give them coffee, tea. Um, caffeine is a highly addictive nervous system stimulant. It has a 17-hour half-life. It has a profound effect on the quality of people's sleep. What's the half-life? 17 hours, I believe, is the half-life on coffee. So in other words, caffeine. So the, the coffee you drink in the morning, although it has a diminishing impact, it still has an impact on your sleep quality. And when people are drinking it all day long, it has a profound effect on people. And so I think that you know, eliminating these stimulants is going to be an important first step in helping normalize uh, autonomic function in general and adrenal function more specifically. And the problem with the, there's a limited amount of research available right now and it's very difficult to tease it apart because remember when you're fasting, you're not drinking coffee and you're not getting all these irritants and stimulants and you're not smoking and you're not, uh, oh and by the way, for example, quitting these habits is dramatically facilitated by fasting, but most smokers by the second day of fasting stop reporting withdrawal symptoms. It's really quite amazing. They're really that's quite that's shocked amazing. how much easier. Now, some people say it's, they're so miserable fasting, they're not thinking about the <laughs> cigarettes and the caffeine, but that's not the case. Uh, caffeine withdrawal is probably one of the more painful symptoms people experience fasting, which is why we ask them to try to wean that down before they come in, because it can be so debilitating coming off caffeine, and yet it's treated as if it's almost like some kind of normal thing. And of course, it's, it's not a normal thing at all. Um, so yeah, I agree, nicotine, caffeine, these, these, these commonly used drugs are devastating uh, in terms of the body's function. Getting rid of them is hugely helpful. That's why we have to tease the benefits of fasting versus the benefits of getting rid of the toxic waste, the benefits of getting rest versus being constantly sleep deprived. You know, there's a lot of things that's happening when you do fasting right. And that's very different than just inducing ketosis on some ketogenic diet or something. You know, what is your take on the ketogenic diets out there? Because most of them are recommending a lot of meat. Is that something that's... Well, I think the reason why they're getting some decent results in some studies is because people are already eating as much meat as they can. All they're doing is getting rid of the refined carbohydrates. <laughs> so if you're already eating meat three times a day and you take the refined carbohydrates about it, it doesn't mean the meat's good for you. It just means getting rid of all the sugar, which is what 80 or 85% of the carbohydrates are eating is sugar and white flour and stuff. So that we agree with, getting rid of the sugar. I would suggest let's do a ketogenic diet, but let's do it if we're gonna do it at all on plant-based foods and get rid of the negative side effect of animal foods. And for that matter, if we do a whole plant food SOS free diet, you don't have to worry about you know, artificially inducing ketosis because the body's gonna heal itself anyway. And I would challenge anybody to compare the data of the fasting and whole plant food diet for treating these conditions to, not that there is any data on it, but if there was any, I'd like to, let's do a little comparison, show me the data. So basically what you're saying is you don't even, if, you're, if you adopt to a plant-based diet, an SOS diet, you don't even need to do the ketosis. Uh, Whether it's fasting diet. or ketogenic diet, exactly. Because I mean, a plant-based ketogenic diet, what are you going to have? You're going to have nuts, seeds, maybe some lettuces. I mean, well, you're going to take all your carbohydrates out, so you're not going to have any rice or potatoes or well, anything Well, remember, like any diet that is hypochloric is going to ultimately be ketogenic. So whatever, whatever diet you put together, if it's less calories than what your basal needs are, you're going to, be, you're going to go into yeah. ketosis, you're going to start mobilizing fat stores. But you don't necessarily have to poison yourself in order to be able to induce that change. And so I wouldn't recommend animal-based products, whether we call it a ketogenic diet or anything else, because of the negative effects of introducing those animal-based products uh, on health. So if you're trying to blunt appetite by artificially inducing a state, whether it be fasting or th through a ketogenic diet, you know, that we can have that discussion, but it's not, not, you're not, water fasting isn't a sustainable diet indefinitely, and neither is a ketogenic diet. 
Ultimately, if we want to promote health, we have to feed people the way we're designed. We're designed to burn complex carbohydrates and get our food from whole natural foods. I'd like to reiterate that there are different clinics around the world and in different countries just to warn people out there. Uh, can you give people some advice as to what to look for when they're looking for a water fasting, supervised water fasting clinic or doctor? Well, sure. I mean, a lot of it's common sense. You don't go to uh, somebody that advertises on the internet to have your appendectomy. You, you try to find a person that has some experience with that, perhaps some training and whatever. Um, the International Association of Hygienic Physicians is an international group of doctors that specialize in supervised fasting. And so you can go to their website and they have a list of doctors. Um, they're affiliated with the National Health Association, which is a nonprofit organization that does plant-based health education. And they have a list of doctors that are certified by IAHP. Uh, and all those doctors are primary care doctors that have done training in fasting supervision. So there'd be reliable sources of advice about how to do it, how to do it properly. Where, where, would, where do you go to get that training? Well, one of the places is the True North Health Center. We have about 30 physicians a year that come in. Some come for a month as a part of their schooling. Some come for three months. They do it in lieu of perhaps their final quarter in school. Uh, we're an ND residency site, so we have one, usually one doctor that comes for one year. And, uh, and then we have a lot of doctors that come um, that have already been in practice for years. They're just looking to do something worthwhile with their life now and actually get some people well. So they'll come, they'll learn how to use this, and then hopefully carry this information home to their practice. So with your experience, what conditions does fasting not work on? Well, when you think about what it does work on, it's usually conditions of dietary excess. So the conditions that are caused or made worse by eating too much of the wrong things, you can be confident that fasting might be helpful. So whether it's obesity and high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease to diabetes to the host of autoimmune diseases, more recently we published a paper in the British Medical Journal on the successful treatment of lymphoma cancer with fasting and diet. The conditions that it won't be as effective on are going to be the conditions that really have nothing to do with dietary excess. There are certain neurological conditions, some genetically mediated conditions, conditions that are uh, traumatically induced wouldn't necessarily be a dietary excess situation. And so those conditions you wouldn't necessarily think of fasting as the primary thing. Conditions where the ability of the body to adapt to fasting is limited. For example, if people's kidney disease is too severe, you may not be able to do water-only fasting because they wouldn't be able to adapt biologically to the fasting state successfully. If, for example, they had unstable cardiac arrhythmia, the, the, there could be some stresses because of the electrolyte changes that happen in fasting, so you wouldn't want to necessarily take a chance of making that worse. Uh, people that have certain clotting disorders or other things, you might have to not use water-only fasting. You have to do a different kind of approach to deal with those. Some people might respond physically, but maybe they have neuropsychiatric conditions that make them more difficult to manage clinically. Maybe those aren't going to be patients that you would do fasting with. People that can't give informed consent you know, it might be a difficult uh, situation. So there's lots of people that are not good candidates. Mostly people that are afraid of fasting. If you know, Fear is a very ex expensive emotion. And so if people are unduly f afraid of fasting, um, that would, you'd have to get them educated before you start fasting because the fear itself could be a real limiting factor. And that's one of the problems with people fasting at home. It's not that people couldn't fast on their own. It's that the anxiety that comes up because of not being quite sure how to deal with the various symptoms. Or if they call their doctor, they'll say, what are you crazy? You're going to die. And that doesn't help induce a calm and, and healthful state. And so that's why sometimes being in a setting where patients are able to get reassurance that no, this is okay. For example, in our clinic, every patient is seen a minimum of twice a day by one of the staff doctors. So we evaluate them, we check them out, we make sure we figure out what's going on, we provide reassurance. They're there with 60 other people that are doing this process. They're getting educated, they're seeing the changes. It's very reassuring. If you're on your own and something comes up, even if it's a perfectly normal thing, like if you don't know that in fasting that bile acids tend to dump and you get this green and yellow slime that can be excluded from the body, whether it's through diarrhea or vomiting, that might, you might think there's something really seriously wrong, when in reality it may be a normal process. When you've, if you're working, well, in our case, we've had 16,000 people go through fasting. We've seen, I wouldn't say we've seen it all, but we've seen a lot. And so, you know, you learn just by experience over time what you're expecting, when it's showing up, does it correlate, you have the reliable data to go back to, you can provide a high degree of reassurance that everybody, you know, that walks in is going to walk out. So far, 16,000 fasters have walked in and 16,000 factors have walked out. We're really trying hard to keep that record 
you know, unblemished. And you also help people determine how long they need to fast. I mean, I bet you get that question all the time. I'd like to do a long-term water fast. I like to come to your center. How long do I need to stay there? Or how long do I need to fast? How do people... Well, we tell them definitively, we don't know. Because the fast is not only therapeutic, but it's diagnostic. So we never know exactly what to recommend in terms of the ideal amount of time fasting until we see how the person's responded faster. For example, if you come in and your blood pressure, say, 240 over 120, and you're capped out on five medications, we know you're pro and you're 50 pounds overweight, we know you're probably going to be with us longer than the person that's 138 over 88, not on medication, is just looking to do a little blip. They may have a five to 10 day fast and be fine. This person might have a 40 day fast, or they might have two 20 day fast, or they might have, you know, depending on what else is going on. Now, pretty much we can get pretty good idea of what the recommendations are just based on our experience looking back at our data, but you can't know with specificity for any given patient exactly what's recommended. And that's why we have a really flexible booking policy. We have people book the longest we think they might be there, but there's no penalty because they get done early. So they can stay as long or as short as they want. There's no fixed program. There's no thing they have to commit to anything. We just go in and we take it day by day. There, everybody's working with a primary doctor assigned to their care. Everybody's working with a staff that's monitoring their care. And so they can make that decision one day at a time. What we're hopefully doing is we want to get them as close to optimum health and function and weight as possible so that when they go home, they can get healthy faster than they're getting sick and old. The idea is just to try to shift the balance. We want you getting healthier faster than you're getting older, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Have you noticed the difference with, uh, so basically you'll tell them if, if they're better and you see with their diagnostics and everything and that they maybe wanted to be here for 14 days, but you see that they're better in seven days, then you'll let them know and say, hey, you know, you're better. That's, you don't need to be here right. any longer. It happens all the time where we'll have our doctor's meeting because we're reviewing the case and we think, I think this one's done. And we'll go out and they'll say, you know, I, doc, I think I'm done. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's remarkable. There's kind of an internal thing that people go where, you know, they can often tell us by how they feel even before we get the lab back that says, oh yeah, we're probably ready to, and we have certain parameters we're using. We don't let potassium go below a certain level. We, we're monitoring their pulse rate and rhythm because we want to keep our record, you know, perfect. And, uh, but people, people can often tell there's very little conflict between the doc and the patient about, yeah, it's probably it's time to move into the next phase here. I, I know it's so different with every single person. I read, and we haven't talked about the spiritual component of, of fasting yet, but I read a story about a guy, it was a doctor, I can't remember, I think it was Dr. Kamitri or something like that, and he said on the 17th night of his water-only fast, he couldn't go to sleep and had so much energy that he actually got out of bed and ran for four hours straight. And he said at the end of the four hours, he was, I guess he was by a force or something, but he, he went to this whole nother spiritual stage where he could like literally see the auras or he just felt like he was one with the universe. And he tells the story that he felt so loving that he just wanted to hug everybody and just tell everybody how much he loves them. I mean, have you had any experiences like that? I would offer another possible suggestion. Okay. Um, when people are long into a fast and overly exert themselves, they sometimes become very dehydrated and they will hallucinate. And in fact, I had an interesting discussion one time with a person teaching um, American Indian sciences. And they were talking about their vision quests that are done. Now that's a dry fast. okay? And so they go for sometimes up to a week. Um, and I asked them, what happens if the... If the patient has a low water tolerance and they dehydrate and he says we call them medicine men because <laughs> they begin to hallucinate perhaps earlier in the cycle than somebody else so again I'm not I'm not the expert on the spiritual aspects of fasting or anything else I don't know how to get into heaven I don't know what the right flavor of religion believe is we have no interest at the True North Health Center trying to direct people in any way at all we will support whatever their particular belief systems are but some of the things that people experience may be because of this profound effect that fasting does seem to have on people. But in a case like that where a person goes out and running, I would also not rule out dehydration and, and hallucination as a possible explanation of their experience. Running for four hours on the 17th day? Yeah, would be day. the recommendation that I would make for people. So I would just be concerned about that. But having said that, and in all seriousness, 
uh, fasting does have a profound effect on people, how they feel about themselves and how they feel about the world around them. And that's, I think, why so many religions have found utility in advocating people experience this process uh, in their life. And, uh, and it certainly comes up frequently with patients, but it's not the basis upon which we happen to be recommending people undergo right. fasting. We're really looking more at the physical health promotion, you know, uh, type aspects. The fact that there are some what we call side effects, that it affects people on a moral, ethical, and spiritual basis, that's great, but it's, we're not trying to pitch fasting because of inducing those effects. That's just kind of a, a welcome side effect. So, you know, a lot of doctors have written over the years, a lot of natural doctors, how negative emotions and resentment and jealousy and all these different negative patterns can affect your health chronically. Have you noticed that people that have, you know, might, they go through a period of cleansing, emotional cleansing at all, and, and you know, end up crying or end up becoming, you know, letting go of some of those deep emotional pains and stuff? Well, there's a profound, yeah, people are very open and vulnerable in fasting, which is why it's so important that we put them in a protective environment, supportive environment, uh, because they are much more sensitive and uh, volatile. And, you know, it can be very entertaining having 60 patients together fasting all at the same time. You know, you remove the drugs, you remove the alcohol, you remove their food. You know, uh, a lot of times they have uh, significant uh, issues. That's one of the real uh, interesting aspects of working as a clinician at the True North Health Center. We get everybody else's most motivated uh, patients. But unfortunately, motivation, the most effective motivators are pain, debility, and the fear of death. So people that are really up against it are the ones that are willing to do dangerous and radical things like eat good exercise and go to bed on time and do fasting. And so we tend to see a high percentage of people that are highly motivated by their health conditions. But we're starting to see more people that are actually healthy and wanting to use fasting as a health promotion tool and an and a anti-aging tool and a disease prevention tool. And that's kind of exciting because those are patients who are a lot easier to manage, frankly, because they're healthy and... <laughs> You know, we're just fine-tuning things rather than wholesale renovating their entire lifestyle. So I kind of like the balance. I think it's a really good thing. I think the success of many of these uh, movies and videos, uh, movies like What the Health and Forks Over Knives and others mm -hmm. that have increased public awareness is increasing the, the number of people that are thinking of this as a health-promoting tool rather than some kind of crazy, you know, uh, offbeat, uh, extreme intervention. What have you learned, like some of the like top three things that you've learned over the last 30, 40 years that you've been doing this, um, that you could give advice to other practitioners or other people out there regarding fasting in general, water fasting? Well, I'd say with or, fasting, it's really important to either do it right or don't do it. Because if you don't do it right, that, that it really makes it bad, not only for your patients, but also for fasting in general, because it is relatively new that people are being exposed to it. We're really trying to minimize the uh, inevitable but unfortunate consequences that happen when people don't do this procedure properly. Uh, the procedure of fasting itself is inherently safe and effective. It's just that the people that are applying it aren't always in, a, in the best position to be able to take that kind of a vigorous approach. And as a consequence, unless you get people that have been properly evaluated and monitored, there's going to be uh, unfortunate consequences and we're trying to minimize that. That's the advantage of the intermittent fasting and some of the less vigorous forms of this is that it's much safer and even though it's slower that's what makes it safer because you're not getting very rapid changes that you see with water only fasting. In general I think that stress uh, which is a huge and dominant factor for people living in the modern world it's kind of like Christmas it's better to give than receive so I suggest people try to be generous and you know delegate that out and try to avoid bringing that stuff in uh, particularly into their internal and their home environment. If they can try to create a little bit of a, a safe space every day where they can decompress and adapt. Maybe it's not important to watch the news every single day. Maybe just, you know, uh, once in a while you can, you know, keep in touch with what's going on. Because honestly, if you look at it from the beginning of the year to the end of the quarter to the end of the not a whole lot of stuff's changed. It's not absolutely critical you, that you be up on each and every tweet and each and every little thing that happens to come out uh, that tend to get people overwhelmed. You don't need to watch the TV news every night and see the worst possible thing could happen to anybody and have to live it and live in color every single night. I don't know that that's necessary to be a fully informed 
member of society. So if we start putting our time and energy into things that are more health promoting rather than health compromising, perhaps we can shift the balance in the right direction and have enough time to do what's important, like eat a whole plant food SOS free diet, exercise and get enough sleep. Yeah, it's all based on what you're putting in your body. If someone, wanted, if someone asked you for your opinion, what would be better to do intermittent fasting on a regular basis, to do a one day a week fasting, or to do alternate day fasting? I think it depends on what our goal is and, and what the patient is. One of the things that we do at the True North Health Center, which is good, is if people go onto our website at healthpromoting.com and complete what are called the registration forms, which gets us their medical history, they can call and have a free phone conversation with me and I'll help them at least fine tune some of these things or point them in the direction where they might be able to get more directed help. I, I'm hesitant to say specifically this is better than that because for one person mm -hmm. this approach mm -hmm. might make the most sense, the other a combination of it might make the most sense and there's so many different variables that people have because sometimes the limiting factor is not just their diagnosis but it's their work circumstance. It, you know, the person that's got four kids and a job and it's commuting is different than the person that has you know, that's retired, a person that's 65, not on meds versus, you know, 80 on meds, somebody that's living in a nursing home or a senior housing that has limited control over their food stuff is different than the person that has, you know, full control over their domain. Uh, and so I don't, I think they all have application that can be useful. Juice fasting versus water only fasting, you know. Well, remember, juice fasting isn't fasting, it's feeding. Feeding, it's just yes. feeding on high sugar, yes. processed fruit or vegetable materials. So 600 calories of juice, four juices a day, would be about the same physiological effect as 600 calories of fruits and vegetables, but it's much more palatable. And so for a person that's been used to eating greasy, slimy, fatty, processed, salty, crappy food and can't choke down healthy foods because they're disgusting to them, you can give them juices and they'll drink them. And if you give them juices for a few days, now maybe they can eat fruits and vegetables because they'll neuroadapt a little bit and they're able to you know, overcome mm -hmm. some of their uh, uh, addictions, their pleasure trap addictions. So juice fasting may be helpful, particularly for people that can't eat the fruits and vegetables. It can help them get to where they can eat the fruits and vegetables. Sometimes you'll use juice fasting because you're trying to do a little bit of a intervention. You want to remove the fiber and, and facilitate the changes that happen with a lower caloric intake. That might be fine too, but I'm not like, there's nothing magic about juice. It's just that particularly vegetable juices are a way of getting more vegetables in, both by taste and by removing excess fiber, and that can be a good thing. But since most people's conditions is dietary excess, not dietary deficiency, getting more or more concentrated stuff in isn't generally the primary concern that we have, unless the person has a deficiency syndrome, in which case, you know, it's going to be a little bit different. Well, from, from a therapeutic standpoint, people ask, you know, for, for, let's say, 14-day, coming here and doing a 14-day water-only fast versus staying at home and doing a 14-day juice fast. Biochemically, physiologically, what, I mean, again, everybody's Hold different. Hold ball game. See, the water-only <laughs> fast induces unique biological adaptation that's not going to happen on a feeding program of any kind. There's a difference there. Now, how profound that difference is, is still to be determined. Some of our studies are looking at exactly those issues. I know if you just do the intermittent fasting, do we get the same long-term biochemical changes that we do with long-term fasting? We don't know yet. You know, um, I would suggest, though, that we're likely to see profound differences because we yes. do see them profoundly clinically. Mm -hmm. I can fast people on juices for weeks or months, and, and then once we put them in the fast, now, but the disadvantage is when you go on the juice fast, everything is much slower, so it's safer. People can adapt to it. It may be perfectly appropriate for somebody to do that, not in as controlled a setting. They still need to kind of rest because you don't want them doing normal activities if they're only getting 600 calories a day, but different issue. Water only fasting, everything, it's like really turned up. And so that's why almost all the clinics in the world do juice fasting or modified fasting because clinically, if you have 60 people fasting, we, that's why we have 15 doctors and, and 53 people on staff because it takes a whole lot more to safely control and, and supervise that than it does say juice fast where you have one clinician and a whole whole facility full of people because you just don't get some of those other issues, which can be good, but also can be a little frustrating. If you've got a person that's seriously ill, we've got to get them well enough before they throw a clot, have a stroke, have the heart attack. We don't necessarily want to take six months or a year. We want to do it kind of now. If we're trying to aggressively withdraw people off medication, they can only stay at a facility so long. 
they've got jobs and kids and you know other annoyances that living their life and so sometimes we're using fasting just because we're trying to speed things up somebody's told they have to have surgery we're trying to avoid surgery if we can get that change in this window that we've got mm -hmm. sometimes we can save them from having you know the medical mutilation and actually get a good result Safe read, a lot of doctors these days are talking about Fong and they're talking about autophagy and, and the beneficial effects of autophagy with water only fasting. And I haven't seen any research that the body actually kicks into a high degree of autophagy with anything but water only fasting. Right. Do you have a comment on that? No, I think that's true. I think that and, and longer fasting has profoundly greater effects. Now this is something that we have got the data coming in now. We've got 21 subjects that we, did, we just completed before and after fasting. Those samples have been extracted and sent off and they're going to be looking specifically as at least one of the variables is autophagy. So they can measure the effect if you see, we'll see what the effect is later. We'll be able to compare and contrast that to intermittent fasting as well as modified feeding. So we are getting that baseline data right now and uh, I will predict that we'll find a profound effect with prolonged fasting but we, we don't know for sure yet. The USC study not too long ago with 72 hour water fasting and the benefits with uh, immune stem cell production, also with chemotherapy. Do you have any thoughts on? Well, yeah, Walter Longo has done some really pioneering research and he published a wonderful review article in 2015 in Journal of Metabolism. And amongst, he cites all the different benefits of water only fasting, including citing our data on hypertension. Now I evaluated another researcher's intelligence by how much they agree with me. So that article made him a genius, you know. So no, he's done a great job. He showed, if you, he had took 30 rats that uh, had cancer and, and gave them enough chemotherapy to kill all the cancer cells, but of course the, all the rats die because the chemotherapy kills them. Took the same kind of rats with the same kind of cancer, um, fasting, but this time he used fasting in conjunction with chemotherapy and he concluded that he had profoundly uh, improved benefits with uh, improved outcomes and all 30 rats survived treatment if he utilized the fasting in conjunction with it. He talks about differential stress resistance and differential stress sensitization. It basically means that healthy cells are protected by fasting. Uh, glutathione, other antioxidant cascades, other postulated mechanisms protect healthy cells during the fasting state from the ravages of chemotherapy. And cancer cells, perhaps because of their higher metabolic rate, are more vulnerable to chemotherapy during fasting than during the fed state. They don't like the fasting state. And it may be that some of these biomarkers turn off in fasting whether you do chemotherapy or not. So, you know, that's all stuff that's just really starting to come out now and it's very exciting and very interesting. Um, and it goes along with what we saw. We published a paper, uh, a case report in the British Medical Journal. Uh, this was uh, now two years ago on a woman uh, with a stage three follicular lymphoma. So she had externally palpable lesions, upper and lower extremity had been well worked up, had her uh, proper diagnostic testing, CT biopsy, etc. Uh, despite the fact that her physician said that fasting was criminal quackery, she decided to come in, did a 21-day fast during which time her tumors disappeared, went back for follow-up, and uh, ultimately got uh, CT follow-up, one-year uh, outcome data, and now I, she's actually at the clinic, just arrived yesterday for wow. a follow-up. Two years, CT says she's cancer-free, She's done great. Um, I even wrote to the oncologist at one year when we decided to su submit the case report, and I said, you know, thank you so much for all the confidence you showed in encouraging your patient to fast at the True North Health Center. And as I'm sure you expected, of course, she's gone into full remission, and we're so looking forward to working with you in the years to come in tracking her success. And now that our paper's been accepted for review, we'd like to invite you on as the co-author of the paper. <laughs> yeah. Bottom line is, here's a situation where a woman who is uh, able to bypass uh, chemotherapy and make a recovery. But the thing that's unique about her is she sustained the diet. Mm -hmm. So she sustained her weight loss, she sustained cooperation with the diet, and she sustained her outcome. In fact, she's continued to improve her objective measures. The initial neutropenia has resolved, all of her counts look good, her CTs are, are clear. And I don't think that it's a question of curing lymphoma, I think it's about managing lymphoma. And I think if you put her back on a greasy, fatty, salami, dead, decaying flesh diet, she would manifest mm -hmm. her cancer again. So, you know, I think that's the, the mind shift we have to go away from thinking about cure to thinking about management. And a better management strategy, in my opinion, is using fasting and diet, sleep, and exercise rather than drugs and chemotherapy and surgery when possible.
I've heard reports of people that had scars, that their scars have completely gone away, uh, polycystic ovarian, uh, fibrocystic breast disease, a lot of the cysts or abnormal tissue in the body with long-term water fasting, as opposed to that doesn't happen with, or I haven't read any reports with juice, you know, or any of the other technologies out there, but then I have seen reports with, you know, the cysts well, or the abnormal tissue. There's tissues. a reason that might be happening. One possible reason, again, we're just, this is one of these things we're looking at, is estradiol levels, when they get excessive in the body, cause or associated with lots of symptoms like fibrocystic breast disease and PCOS and uterine fibroid myomas and menorrhagia and men, all kinds of these hormone-associated problems. Well, in water-only fasting, one of the changes that happens is there's a profound change in the microbiome and, and the, the floor in the gut. The type of, the strains of bacteria that live in the gut, and more importantly, the gut poo. When you think about it, you have five pounds of bacteria living in your intestinal tract. There, it's a, like a liver or a kidney, it's like a whole organ. But this is living creatures that give off waste products. Now, if you feed those bacteria, for example, meat, we know one of the waste products you get is TMA, which becomes TMAO, which is trimethyl amine oxidase, is highly irritating, associated with heart disease, other problems. If you feed your bacteria soluble fiber, you get fertilizer, vitamin K and all kinds of good stuff. So we want the poo in our gut giving us fertilizer, not toxic waste. What makes one organism that's in the body sometimes nasty, sometimes helpful? Well, some of it depends on its exotoxins or its waste products. And so one thing that the diet does is allow the bacterial flora, which is so important in our immune system, to feed us rather than kill us or poison us. Well, what fasting does, it may allow the gut flora to actually recalibrate itself. It's like rebooting a hard drive in a computer that's become corrupted. You don't exactly know maybe why it's now working, but once you reboot the damn thing, it's, you know, <laughs> things are working again. And that seems to be what's happening. And now we're trying to find out exactly what's happening. Is it the strains of bacteria that are changing? Or is it the waste products that those bacteria are giving off changes or a combination of all of that? But the net effect is fasting seems to have a profound effect on that, different than, say, modified fasting may have. So you don't, oh, and if you get a change in the bacterial flora, you may process estradiol to something called estriol. Estriol is excreted. So instead of the estradiol accumulating and being associated with all these symptoms, maybe it's allowed to be processed more effectively. And that may be one of the reasons why fasting and these dietary changes are affecting what seems like so many different kinds of conditions. How could one approach affect so many different kinds of things? Well, because it's affecting mm -hmm. so many different kinds of processes in the body. And identifying which of those processes are how to do this right, which is the entire mission of the True North Health Foundation, is to do the research to actually look at it. And we're in a unique position to do that. Essentially, the True North Health Center is a human subjects laboratory. We're in a position because we have, our, we have a research director, we've got our own IRB, we've got things in place now to begin to collaborate with other researchers that are interested in have, figuring out what these you know, answers to these questions are that everybody's interested in, which is what? Can we slow down aging? Can we reverse aging? Can we reverse the, the processes associated with aging? Can we delay or defer the debility that's so devastating people in industrialized countries? Can we let people live longer, healthier, and happier? And I think the answer is yes. The only problem is people don't want to hear the answer because it involves changing their lifestyle. Yeah. Yes. So what happens to the microbiome, the gut bacteria, when, um, or have you guys done any studies well, on that at all? Have, Some people out there are saying, well, you're going to kill off all your uh, gut bacteria if you don't have anything in the bowel. Right. <laughs> so we have actually done the, the collection, but we don't have the data back. It's being processed literally as we speak. Okay. There are people working on those analyses right now. It's actually fairly complicated because you have literally um, um, trillions of cells that are involved in terms of the bacteria, the, the cells that live in the body and, and billions of, of, of cells that live in the gut and hundreds or thousands of strains. So it's not really just super simple, but they are, yeah. that's what they do. And they're looking at those issues right now and we'll start to be able to understand it better and then be able to ask more specific questions as we go through and do further clinical trials. One of the, one of the main benefits that excites me about the water only fasting is the autoimmune diseases that are running rampant today. <laughs> and the success that you've had with working with autoimmune patients. Can you just briefly talk about well, that? Well, autoimmune diseases are one of the more gratifying diseases in part because medical management sucks. Yeah. So basically, here's the model. 
you get some gut leakage, you absorb some proteins, the immune system reacts inappropriately, perhaps because of genetic variants, perhaps because of accumulative issues, and now the immune system attacks your own tissues. Rheumatoid arthritis, the reason you get deformity, it's your immune system attacking your joints. Ulcerative colitis, it's your immune system attacking your joint, or possibly the gut microbiota running out of soluble fiber to eat that now in desperation lives off the mucosal membrane of your intestinal tract. Uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you eat wheat, uh, the gene that's associated with Gluten sensitivity also happens to be associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And perhaps what's happening is the immune system begins to react to your own thyroid tissue. Now you develop hypothyroidism. Autoimmune disease is autoimmune, you attacking you. What may be triggering that, at least in some cases, is inappropriate dietary factors, free radicals that lead to gut leakage that stimulate the immune response. And so the medical approach is, oh, well, if the immune system is attacking you, we'll just turn off the immune system. We'll give you prednisone. We'll just shut it all down. And it's like a dream because the pain goes away. But that dream becomes a nightmare because it turns out you need your immune system. And when you shut off the immune system, eventually you get big problems, sometimes bigger problems than you had when you had the autoimmune disease. So the answer is not shutting down the immune system, as appealing as that can be in terms of getting some immediate short-term relief. Um, the answer is, one, get rid of the gut leakage by getting rid of the free radicals, get rid of the, the proteins that tend to leak, the, the dairy products, the glutinous grains, the sugars, and then let the gut heal, perhaps with fasting or with a carefully controlled diet, and then stop the future onslaught and you can control the condition. And that's exactly what we see. The lupus patients go from having agonizing, debilitating pain to being out of pain, off the drugs. Mm -hmm. The problem is they have to stick to the diet. If they don't stick to the diet, the condition tends to flare, which makes them perfect patients because they can't cheat. And so what happens is if you're, if you're, listen, pain is a huge motivator. Yes. So if you feel good when you're eating good and you feel bad when you're eating bad, after you do that a few dozen times, you don't want to eat bad anymore. And so we get increased compliance. So I love patients with autoimmune disease because if you can get them well, it's easier to keep them well. Because the problem with other patients is they get well, they think, well, I'm well now. I don't have to be quite so strict. A little of this won't hurt. A little of this won't hurt. And then eventually they get themselves back into trouble and we have to lock them up and kick them in the butt. So do you think if someone's sick or gets the flu or a cold, they should just go ahead and fast until and just drink water only until their symptoms go away? Well, I that's recommend that big... water only fast will be done in a controlled setting after a proper exam with proper supervision. Yeah. But as far as reducing the caloric load, absolutely. Intermittent fasting or possibly drinking juices or other things if it's appropriate for their particular condition might be a perfectly appropriate way. By lightening the caloric load and limiting the amount of digestive processes, you may give the body a chance to more rapidly overcome the problem. What you don't want to do though is get people dehydrated or into trouble, uh, and that can be a compounding factor, particularly for children, which are more vulnerable to dehydration. Maintaining adequate hydration during fever is an important issue. So no, I wouldn't recommend people just, but on the other hand, let's say you're not hungry. Do you ever think it's a good idea to eat when you're not hungry? Maybe you skip a meal or two and you rest and you drink water. You know, that may be perfectly appropriate. If you're gonna get involved in prolonged water only fasting, then it would be really good if you had a doctor that wasn't an idiot that could support you and just kind of evaluate and give you a little bit of guidance. And for people that are interested, we do, are, we're happy to try to refer them to doctors that we know that have had some training, they've done an internship, they're, they're, they have familiarity with these issues. Because it's a really different approach than conventional medicine, which is, oh, you have symptoms, here's some powerful drugs, that'll make you feel better. It won't get you better, but it'll make you feel better. Take the drugs, go away, and don't ask me too many questions. We don't want that. We want to, why am I sick? What can I do to actually get healthier? What can we do to allow the body to try to heal itself? That's a much more involved, much more detailed process. And unfortunately, most people have neither the time or the energy to really try to address the cause of the problem. They just want short-term fix. And that's why it's so appealing, because medicine gives people what they want, that magic pill, that immediate answer, that quick fix solution. And our approach is kind of slow and difficult and takes a whole lot of work. So it's really only applicable to people that are highly motivated. So they're either pain, debility, fear of death, or they're really smart and want to do health promotion for the long run. Ultimately, the goal is to get people off their medications. And so you, you had said that you do turn down some people uh, that apply for the well, clinic. We have only so much capacity, so and we run full, so we can't accept everybody. So what we try to do is take people that we think are going to have a good result. So that's basic. It's more fun. It turns out even if people go through discomfort during fasting, if they get well, they forgive you for everything. They love it. 
if, even if people don't have much problems, if they don't get well, then they're not as happy. So we try to take people that we have a reasonable expectation that their net effect is going to be positive. And we're in a fortunate position because unlike most doctors that treat whoever walks in and they do their best with them and they don't have the luxury of that, we get a chance to pick our patients. And most of our patients, first of all, they wouldn't know about us unless they were on a health mission looking for stuff or they were referred by a doctor. And the only doctors referring to us are the doctors that know what we do typically. Mm -hmm. And those are doctors that either trained with us or they're familiar with fasting and diet and all this kind of stuff. So we end up getting everybody else's one or two most motivated patients that they see in a year. And so our entire practice is these highly motivated, self-selected people, oftentimes very knowledgeable, but have a specific problem they've got to overcome. That is a fun practice for most doctors. Most doctors will tell you they spend 80% of their energy on the 20% of the patients that are never going to get well because they're not willing to do dangerous and radical things like eat good exercise or go to bed on time. And they get the most pleasure out of the 20% of the patients that they have to do very little with actually because all they have to do is point them in the right direction. Because once a person gets how health works, the doctor's role becomes really incidental. You know, we're mostly a coach and an encourager at that mm -hmm. point because we're not having to do interventions and all this kind of stuff. We're really just trying to help, you know, when, when people tend to wander off their little path a little bit, try to point them back on the right direction. Whereas in conventional care, it's completely different. You're entirely dependent on the doctor's great wisdom to give you which, which version of toxic waste they need that week to try to make the symptoms you're currently having go away, even if the current symptoms you're having are a consequence of the previous treatment that you had, which is now being manifested you know, in, a, in a different manner. Would you take somebody if they had just been through chemotherapy and radiation? I mean, how? Well, wouldn't, how, I, I have lots of people that are coming to okay. recover from the consequence of medical yeah. treatment. You know, a lot of times people have undergone all kinds of invasive treatments, and now they're dealing with the consequences of that treatment. So a lot of times where we are coming in is not to cure their condition, but to right. help them function better within the context or limitations of what they've had. And that's true post-surgical recovery. A lot of people will take advantage of Truman Health Center to come because we're a fraction of the cost of any place else. So they can recover with us affordably and at the same time fine-tune the diet and lifestyle you know, that they need to, to do to avoid the problem from coming back. You know, cardiovascular patients are a good example. They may have undergone stents or had bypass or other things, but unless they change their diet, they will be plugging those things back up again. Where, where we might come in is teaching them how to do the diet and lifestyle stuff so that they can avoid and defer or delay having to undergo additional medical intervention. Do you have anything else you'd like to add that we didn't talk about that you think would be beneficial for? Well, again, I think that the basic principle is real simple. Health results from healthful living. You've got to focus on healthy living. Now, the only discussion should be about what is healthy living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, intelligent people can disagree on that. What I would suggest is always ask doctors the following questions. What evidence do you have that the treatment you're recommending to me is going to either help me live longer or live better? Say, not everything's going to make you live longer, including medical treatment, but maybe it'll help you live better. But if the doctor says there's no evidence that what I'm doing is going to make you live longer, and there's no evidence that the treatment I'm doing is going to make you live better, why are you doing the treatment? That's what I, that's what I have a hard time understanding. Because <laughs> like you see these commercials on TV, take this drug, oh, by the way, it's going to cause pain, and this, and this, and this, and this, and... And then it's just well, like, it's a small you... price to pay to not to have to change your diet and lifestyle, isn't it? <sighs> Crazy. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate you pleasure. spending the time with me today and everybody watching. And if you guys have any additional questions, let me know. And I'll try to get with Dr. Goldhammer to get an answer. Mm -hmm.